knowledge and some perspective that you didn't have when you uh, came in the room. Um, we're expecting uh, Representative Napolitano and Representative uh, Tim Ryan uh, here shortly, and when they come in, I'll introduce them and let them make some opening remarks. Um, but until then, I just want to say that um, suicide prevention, depending upon which side of the coin you look at, um, you can see suicide prevention as being one aspect of mental health. You, if you look at it from the other side, um, you can see that mental health is one, better mental health care is one of many strategies that we would use to prevent suicide. So uh, depending upon again, which side you look at it, suicide prevention is part of mental health, or mental health is part of suicide prevention, um, and they're both true. So let's look at, um, uh, first slide, there we go. So uh, now let's go back to the overview. So th we're going to give you a little bit of an overview about what the National Action Alliance is all about, some of the achievements that have been accomplished in its uh, relatively short lifespan. Um, we'll go through the four initial priorities that we're really focusing on as an Action Alliance. And then I want to talk with you about some things that members can do to promote suicide prevention. And guess what? I'm not going to ask for an appropriation. There's some things that you can do that actually are free, um, other than you know some uh, some commitment of, of uh, political capital, so to speak. Um, so let's uh, go to the next slide. Um, just a very quickly framing of the magnitude of the problem of suicide. Uh, it is really one of the leading public health problems in our country. The tenth leading cause of death. Um, the, the, uh, the second leading cause of death among uh, young people, and uh, there's been a, a significant increase in suicides uh, among uh, middle-aged adults, 35 to 64 group. Uh, it's uh, about uh, the same number of people die by suicide as uh, die, uh, say, to, to breast cancer. Much more people die to suicide than to HIV, um, or and about three times the number who died to homicide. Um, and because auto accidents have gone down significantly, um, now more people are dying to suicide than, um, than died to auto accidents. So at this time, Representative Republic, do you want to speak before you? Uh, Carry on. <laughs> really? I'm you're, you're enjoying rice cream, so I, I don't want to interrupt that. Well, let's just go on a minute. And, uh, when Representative Brian gets here, then you want to make some comments or talk about the race. Um, so we've got the agenda fixed. So and I just want to talk with you about um, you know the history of congressional support for suicide prevention. Um, it goes back to the 97, 98 time frame when um, both houses of Congress passed resolution, resolutions um, making it clear that suicide prevention was an important public health problem and that we needed to address it. We needed to develop a national strategy. So the first national strategy was developed in 2001. Um, shortly after that, there was funding um, for the Gearley Smith Memorial Act. Um, I'll say a little bit more about the connection to that, to Congress. Um, but that funds um, grants through SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, for um, states, um, tribes, and campuses to do suicide prevention work. It also funds the National Suicide Prevention Resource Center, um, which um, all of us um, have a job at. Um, there's also then uh, funding for the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, which um, connects, also through SAMHSA, um, connects crisis centers across the country. I think there are about 150 now um, certified crisis centers that are linked to one number. So the person now in this country and military people around the world can call one number and get a person who is really expert in talking with them about um, suicide uh, and perhaps their own um, desire to die. Um, and then there's, of course, um, legislation that uh, came out of Congress supporting suicide prevention in the VA. So let's just go to the next slide. Um, there are uh, definitely many members of Congress involved at, at uh, various levels and previous members. Um, upper right hand corner is a representative, uh, former representative John McHugh. He's now Secretary of the Army. Um, and he is one of the co-chairs. He's the public sector co-chair of the National Alliance. And then on the left is uh, former Senator um, Gordon Smith from uh, Oregon. And uh, Senator Smith is the private sector co-chair. He's now president and CEO 
of the National Association of Broadcasters, which many of you may know is also very active in promoting uh, mental health issues. Um, bottom right hand corner, uh, another shot of, uh, uh, there we go, yep. Senator Smith, uh, along with Secretary Sebelius and Secretary Gates that launched the Action Alliance back in September of 2010. Um, and then here we have our very own Representative Napolitano in a briefing not too long ago uh, uh, that included some suicide prevention um, content. Um, so the next slide, this is just a, a, a list of uh, members or former members that are involved in the Action Alliance. Um, uh, we also have just um, brought on uh, Senator Byron Dorgan, who's uh, been long a champion of suicide prevention among American Indians, American Indian youth, and, uh, and then, of course, the Representative Napolitano. So, at this point, would you like to make some comments? Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. Litz. It's, it's wonderful to be here and to have uh, such a wonderful reception with the ice cream. Right on. Um, it is really uh, important for all of us to continue doing, recognizing the work that is being done by the Alliance and others, but I certainly want to uh, uh, note that mental health is beginning to take a little more hold in the capital. Uh, the recognition, the fact that staff is here and some of the folks that support the issues that we're all been uh, promoting for I don't know how many years. Um, we've worked extensively to continue the outreach, but I certainly thank you, Alliance, for uh, um, bringing in um, us together again and continuing the dialogue that is so critical to all of us. Uh, as you know, we've uh, got the uh, uh, Mental Health Caucus uh, that we're hoping to re, re Institute, we're in the process of doing that. But being able to uh, get organizations to come and talk about it to members of Congress and their staff so that they can begin to understand the severity of the problem. Because it isn't something that's going to go away, it's getting worse. And uh, we, we were involved many years ago with Latina with some suicide uh, that uh, was still the highest percentage in the U.S. of attempted suicides, ages 9 to 11, Spanish. So that caused us to begin to look at our own backyard and say, well, what can we do? Who do we reach out to? What's being done? Well, SAMHSA initially had a little bit of money and we started a pilot project, which at this point now is called the Earmark. And so now we're, we've been, this is the third conference, we've attempted to get it funded to put uh, in 200 schools conditions to work with the children to begin at an early age to identify the, the children's emotional problems that show in behavioral uh, aspects in, in the classroom. Um, the program started three middle schools and one high school is currently in 16 schools and still growing. It has now picked up as in California, but the county of Los Angeles in California simply because it's in the market and we can't get a lot of funding out of SAMHSA. That said, there are many programs. What we need to do is find out how do we connect all the dots and being able to get out to the young people you, you met, you, you, you uh, Twitter, you uh, Facebook, you do it. You need to continue sending the message to others. Uh, we just had the uh, uh, right to talk a couple of days ago uh, to talk about uh, it's okay to speak up, it's all right to share, it's all right to ask for help. And uh, we have to have great partners um, essentially, I don't know, almost a decade ago uh, with Entertainment Institute Council to make sure that the media understands how critical it is for them not only to show the problem, but to show solutions and use real life stories to tell the people that it's okay to seek help because there is help. Uh, maybe not enough, and that's something we need to continue working on. But Maria Diane, would you stand up? Energy and Industry Council, they've been our partners for many, many years. So thank you so much for segments in the Army Wise and others, which they still do yearly programming awards for those that, that are continuing to uh, uh, bring on those issues. We all need to know what we're all doing and be able to work together in the network and be more um, cohesive in our and, and getting some of these programs to be uh, addressed, funded, recognized, and spread the world of the word. The word 
uh, National Broadcasters is on. We're hoping to get other folks to be able to spread the word in languages, guys, because we, we're a country of immigrants. And so those are areas that we're very heavily working. Uh, as you well know, mental health knows no boundaries. Uh, just look at the color of your skin or your, whether you're rich or poor. Um, and it's still the third leading cause of, of uh, death in youth 18, uh, 15 to 24. That's a, something that we need to understand that we need to begin working towards getting our young people to understand there is help. And of course, everybody says, well, I don't know how many of you understand Spanish, but uh, in my age, in my um, age range, there was, you're crazy, you belong in a crazy house in a manicomio. Well, that's not totally the truth anymore. I mean, we need to recognize that things uh, prey upon us and that cause us to begin to have uh, concerns. And we need to understand whether it's women's menopause, whether it's a student in school worrying about their grades and begins to falter and begin to have uh, um, a psychotic episodes, but understand that this preys on the mind of a lot of people. A youngster who might have seen a shooting or uh, somebody who lost a parent in, in war or whose parents are divorcing. Those are mental health issues that we need to help our youngsters deal with because if you don't, then they become exacerbated and become things that later on in life prevent these youngsters from really fulfilling their life. So the fact that we want to continue working on suicide prevention, on alerting people what the signs are and how you can spread the word, if you will, to anybody, everybody, students, uh, college students, uh, and grandparents, for goodness sakes. Because uh, I had a story of some people telling my aunt, well, we thought my uncle was a little bit off, but he was a recluse. He happened to be uh, schizophrenic and never talked to anybody who was, was somebody that didn't think needed help. Well, this day we need to recognize kids need help. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the mental health resources is funding census. We need to continue. Now, that first of all, must be recognizing that this is an issue in our modern day world. And we need to be able to work together to counter that. Uh, of course, the education, the training, and of course, uh, making sure that there's enough personnel to answer the calls and the emergency phone numbers that, that we provide them. Um, the uh, mental health task force that I co-chair with uh, Tim Murphy, a uh, child psychologist, is the other world piece, Los Angeles Laker, who's now heading for the New York Knicks. Uh, Mark Bell is dancing with the stars, uh, and of course, Mia St. John, big time female boxing champ for the world. And um, these are people who, in their family or personally, are suffering from, from illness, mental illness. And they recognize it, and they're open about it. Well, we need more of those. So if you need any, if you need anybody or hear of anybody, we need to know who they are because we want them to have people understand that they are admitting that there is an issue. Maybe the other will begin to seek help because these people didn't seek help. Um, the mental health services uh, for the military, critical. Because, and I, I, I carried the banner for years right after um, we started to uh, the war in Iraq. It's, when we, it's a different war. People coming home are going to have problems. We are losing 22 soldiers a day to suicide. A day. Unbelievable, unfathomable, and unacceptable. So how do we work to be able to help those families deal with it, to help the, the veteran? If you hear or, or even think somebody's uh, thinking because they're giving things away or because it's learn the symptoms and understand that we can help. There is a way to be able to reach someone, but you've got to understand what, what you need to look for. So again, I thank the um, uh, members of the Action Alliance, the advocates on the mental health community, but the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention for providing the ice cream. Thank you very much. <laughs> and we we'll hope that you will begin. And I'm glad we have a study room only because let me tell you, you've been very lonely in this room. Well, we know some of them, and there's only maybe about 20 people here. So thank you so very much to all of you for having uh, come and participated. God bless. Is, uh, my colleague, we, we, we are very lucky to have uh, some members of Congress who understand that the, the importance, and uh, this is one of them. Thank you. Paul. Great, thank you. <laughs> um, thank you, Dr. Liss.
calling Captain Blake. This is um, unfortunately a topic that we keep having to have discussions about. And I want to I want to thank Grace for uh, always being a leader in the issue of mental health here in Congress. And I, I just want to say a couple things that I think um, are potentially relevant. First uh, and foremost uh, is that we have to deal with this in a comprehensive way. And I and I love just the three or four words that uh, David, you're going to talk about later about resiliency and connectedness and hope. Uh, we spend a lot of our time working with military folks uh, and we know the rates of suicide are very, very high. A lot of it's because they aren't connected. A lot of it's they, they end up very isolated in places in their towns and cities uh, across the country where they don't have anyone to talk to. And I just want to share with you an initiative that I'm associated with um, from a foundation that's starting called the Mindful Nation Foundation and they're doing work uh, where they're creating a veterans core of vets who will be trained in alternative uh, approaches like mindfulness meditation, yoga, a variety of others, um, where they will learn these techniques or they already, uh, they may already know them, but get them connected, 30 or 40 of them, send them out into the world, skilled in the social media to be able to go back to towns like Youngstown, Ohio, or somewhere, some other small town in the country, and begin to go and find these vets who won't go to the VA. They, they're afraid they're gonna get labeled with post-traumatic stress, and they won't go, and they become more and more isolated, more disconnected, and I want these vets to be trained in these alternative therapies, and then go out and do a search and rescue to find them in their own communities, and start little groups around the country in these alternative methods that really seem to be working uh, in so many ways. More and more vets, more and more people are using things like uh, mindfulness meditation or other forms of meditation where they're being, being able to process a lot of the trauma that they've had and they're also able to bring some more balance into their system. Um, another thing that I wanted to mention too, because Secretary Sebelius is involved in this, is the new research going on uh, not much of it funded through through NIH uh, and the Institutes of Health here, uh, but I think we need to do a lot more. And a component of this, obviously, is short term. How do we stop things now? But a lot of the research that's coming on with stomach imbalances, a lot of uh, people don't know. Ninety-five percent of serotonin is in your GI tract. They're starting to call your stomach your second brain, and a lot of trauma food, diet, all of this thing, can, uh, all of these things can affect the balance in your stomach where serotonin, the feel good hormone is produced. And so I think it's important for us to recognize this as a potential contributor to depression and isolation and all of these things. So we really need uh, to take this, and I know the Alliance is doing this, in a very comprehensive way. And if we don't do that, we're gonna limit the opportunities that we have to really solve these problems uh, in the long run. So I'm, I'm very thankful and, and I'm for the openness that I think, uh, Dr. Litz, that you promote, uh, not getting pigeonholed in the sand, well, this, you know, it's just medication or it's just this or it's just that. We've got to really look at this. Why is this a problem? And what are we doing to address it? And for us, sometimes we get so, things are so complicated today that we think there must be a very complicated solution to some of our things. Uh, solutions to some of our problems when the reality is things are so complicated that the solution sometimes is very simple like are you connected to anybody do you have a friend do you have somebody to talk to that may be the difference from someone who's been very traumatized in their life whether it was a shooting or a gang accident or a parent or domestic abuse that what tips them from killing themselves or not killing themselves is they have a best friend or they have someone that will listen to them so that simple solution cannot be underestimated uh, or a little quiet time each day or different techniques to try to process some of the trauma that you may have. So I'm just very thankful. We are totally supportive from our uh, Military Mental Health Caucus for, for what you're trying to do here. Very thankful that you're taking such a, uh, a strong approach on this and thank everybody for being here. And anything we can do to work in conjunction with you and Grace and her caucus, we want to be a part of it. And we just think that uh, lastly, that there's so many resources that are being wasted by young people, young lives, talent, energy, creativity, that, that ends too soon. And you think about the military side, 
of someone who's trained as a Marine uh, or a soldier and has all these great skills that we admire as Americans, and they have trauma, and if they can overcome it, to bring that success story to our economy, to our education systems, uh, to our social service organizations, wherever they may get back involved once they help themselves, is a boon for our country and a talent that we can really tap into. So thank you so much. Um, unfortunately, I have to take off. My staff will be here, and we want to partner with you as much as we can, whether it's the vet score or anything else that we're doing. So thank you so much. Can we get a quick photo? The guys want to come around and just. By the way, I, I, I'm remiss in my introduction that uh, Jim is the uh, uh, mental, uh, the Veterans Mental Health Caucus, and so I think it's critical for you to learn what they're doing and how they're learning. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody have their ice cream? Yeah. <laughs> I will say there are a couple of extra seats in the front. I know that's my favorite spot. I sure they can have my own little device so somebody can. I wanted to make um, one more connection with uh, Senator Smith, who's our um, private sector co chair, and then Gary Smith from Royal Act. Um, it is um, this fall will be 10 years since Senator Smith lost his son to suicide, and the Gary Smith Memorial Act uh, was named after his son. So with that, um, I want to introduce um, Katie Wooten Deal, who is our um, Deputy Secretary of the Action Alliance, and she's going to take you a little bit more of an overview of what the Action Alliance is and, and what it's doing. Dr. Liz, the oh, presentation. Uh, um, Ami Romero is my mental health coordinator. I've been on it since I hired her years ago. She's uh, passed a bill in her own state on mental health. So you've got to know there's people in the hill that really have a lot of background and have the institutional knowledge and it's kind of rare for myself. Thank you. Hi. Um, at this point, I'd like to just show a short video that will kind of um, give you some context for what the actual line is. The launch of the National Action Alliance for Suicide brought together an impressive group of our nation's leaders from both the public and private. They chose World Suicide Prevention Day to begin their work together. Suicide is a personal and national tragedy. We have lost too many people to a very preventable cause of death, and it doesn't have to be this way. Suicide is a very personal issue for those of us touched directly. It knows no boundaries of age, gender, ethnicity, income, or profession. It was almost seven years ago to this day that my wife and I received the news that our son had taken his life. There is no way to describe the loss of any child. It is the most challenging thing a parent can go through in this life. It tests the limits of every human emotion and leaves those left behind questioning every thought, every comment, and every missed opportunity that survivors believe might have prevented the tragic loss. The effects of suicide run deep. More than 34,000 Americans die by suicide each year. That's one suicide every 15 minutes. I work with the counselors at our school to prevent suicide, something to me that is very important in all Native American communities. Suicide is the second leading cause of death for Indian youth ages 15 to 24 and is 3.5 times higher than the national average. I lost five friends last year to suicide. It was something hard not only for me, but also for all the adults and other youth and tribal council members of Mescalero. It was hard because it wasn't a year span when we lost these people. It was all within one month. Suicide reaches into all parts of society. Research indicates that there are increased suicide rates among veterans. 
and suicide rates among service members recently reached historic highs within the Army and Marine Corps. The Secretary of Defense, my top institutional priority is taking care of those who have borne the burden and paid the price for protecting our nation. That includes doing everything possible to prevent military suicides. It is always a horrible tragedy to see a service member safely off the battlefield, only to lose them to this scourge. We can, we must, and we will do better. It really violates our basic warrior ethos. And that ethos is as important as it is direct and simple. Never leave a fallen comrade behind. That is what motivates us in the Army. But as proud as we are of what we can accomplish on this one, we neither can nor wish to go alone. The National Action Alliance brings together top leaders from the public and private sectors to build on noteworthy achievements in suicide prevention. As we come together today and stand unified in this room as a nation to mark this day, I would say that it is the lives you saved in your years that matter most. And when it comes to preventing suicide, we all have that opportunity. Let's get to work. Let's roll up our sleeves. Let's pull together the very best of ideas. And let's go to a higher plateau where we are actively and anxiously engaged in, in saving human life. The National Action Alliance is not just another high-level committee that will hold a few meetings and write a report. It's a public-private collaboration with real responsibility to take the steps needed to accelerate our work in suicide prevention. We don't have one life to lose in this world, and we're here to bring the full force of our nation's resources to bear in confronting the challenge, breaking the silence, and stopping the pain and suffering. Because so many things divide this town. So many things have been very long. But this one must not. Because this one doesn't register Republican or Democrat. This registers human. I'm here today to talk a little bit based on my experience as a survivor of my own suicide attempt. What I remember, though it's been many years, is the utter hopelessness and despair of being in this place where you want to kill yourself. We have the ability, we have the tools, we have the knowledge to restore hope and health and healing to those who were challenged like my son was. By holding out the light of hope for others, by letting them know we need them, we need our soldiers. We need our family members, our brothers and sisters. We need to preserve the greatest asset, the greatest resource of our country, which are our brothers and sisters, our children and parents. I have said on many occasions like this that those who do this work work on the side of angels. Um, congresswomen, you certainly are doing that as an example here today as well. 
Uh, we're also catalyzing efforts to implement high priority objectives of this national strategy, and I'll speak to that on the next slide, and cultivating the resources that we need to sustain progress. Uh, we're only about three years old and we still have a lot of work to do. Continuing to advance this strategy in these and other ways is what will help us meet our goal of saving 20,000 lives in five years. So to catalyze the implementation of this national strategy, we've prioritized some of objectives from the national strategy that can produce the systems level change that we need to substantially lower the burden of suicide. Dr. Litz earlier talked about some of the statistics. For 34,000 uh, deaths per year is actually an old statistic. It's actually closer to 40,000 a year now. And also objectives that require the public-private collaboration and the national leverage that's offered by the National Action Alliance for Suicide Prevention. So our members, which are about 200 fold now, are advancing these objectives um, in ways that are enhancing our national infrastructure for suicide prevention and also advancing suicide prevention for specific populations and settings. These are a couple examples um, of some of the recent and forthcoming accomplishments of the Action Alliance that speak to uh, objectives of the strategy. So some of our recent accomplishments include revising that national strategy that we've been talking about. It originally came out in 2001. It needed an overhaul so we can reflect the latest in science and practice. This is a pretty young field. Dr. Litz only went back about 15 or 20 years talking about some of the historical milestones here on the Hill. Um, so it's still a pretty young field. We've learned a lot in our short existence and we wanted to incorporate that in a new uh, roadmap for our nation, a new strategy for suicide prevention. You all have copies of that national strategy, a little light reading for later. Um, and that was released last September by the Action Alliance in the Office of the Surgeon General. Uh, we've also developed a report and a website that will help improve the quality of care for patients who are suicidal in boundary health systems, such as emergency departments. And Dr. Liz will say a little bit more about that initiative shortly. We've also produced resources for workplace suicide prevention. Dr. Liz mentioned this age group of uh, adults in their middle years and how do we reach them. So there are there's a task force of the Action Alliance that's produced a few resources, including a comprehensive blueprint for suicide prevention, a manager's guide for postvention or aftercare, what do you do if you lose someone, an employee in the workplace, and also a, a couple sets of videos, one which is tailored to gain more support from CEOs at that leadership level to embrace suicide prevention in the workplace, the other to reach the firefighter community and the risks that they may be at in responding to various forms of trauma. Over the next few months, uh, we're going to release a couple of things that may interest you. Uh, first is a comprehensive set of resources for suicide prevention in the juvenile justice system. In this system, suicide is the leading cause of death. And so this is a very comprehensive uh, set of resources that will help juvenile justice and the mental health systems partner together and to um, aggressively address this leading cause of death. Also, a first ever prioritized research agenda for suicide prevention that will point our limited research dollars towards the areas that will um, likely help us reach that goal of saving 20,000 lives in five years. Uh, next is the plan for assessing and evaluating the implementation of the national strategy. This plan will capture evidence of both progress and outcomes as we work to advance this 2012 version of the national strategy. And then training guidelines for clinicians across all disciplines. Uh, these guidelines will address gaps, problems, and opportunities related to clinicians' suicide prevention capacity. These clinicians um, are our safety net for patients who are suicidal. And usually, they don't have the knowledge and the skills needed to assess and manage suicide risk. So these guidelines, which will come out later this year, um, will help address their training. Next slide. Okay. So this revised strategy that I've been talking about stresses uh, that suicide is a complex public health problem. I think um, Representative Ryan is talking about the complexity of this issue and how we need to address it in a comprehensive fashion. And there are multiple risk and protective factors at play. But it's also a preventable public health problem. It emphasizes that we all have a role to play in its prevention, and it outlines ways that diverse partners um, can take part in promoting protective factors, such as social connectedness that was uh, referenced a couple minutes ago, access to effective health care, and dialogue that is stigma-free, that encourages folks to go out and seek help in various forms. 
Also in reducing risk factors such as substance abuse, access to legal means of suicide, uh, poor quality of health care, and others. And then advancing that comprehensive approach to suicide prevention, intervention, and postvention, kind of a full spectrum of care. So around our table, the action lines are around 200 high-level leaders from diverse sectors, including the congressmen. Um, we also have folks from business, defense, education, faith communities, um, healthcare, justice, research, traditional social media, and organizations that serve Native Americans, veterans, and other populations. Uh, we also have um, uh, Mr. Vega, who is in that video, who is a consumer of mental health services and is a, uh, a, a, a survivor of his own suicide attempt. Other folks like him who have lived experience around this table. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned earlier, we prioritize objectives with the strategy. Um, these are our four initial priorities, and now in the next couple of minutes, we're going to outline them in greater detail, and I'll start with data and surveillance point. So currently, I know data surveillance is not a very sexy topic, but it's a very important topic. We currently have about an 18-month time lag on the national level of knowing the scope of the suicide problem in this country related to deaths by suicide or mortality data. Though this lag has decreased from about three years to 18 months, we still have a long way to go to uh, have better access to timely data that can do a number of things. It can help us monitor trends in the data. It can help inform our policy and program development. It can also help us evaluate what we're doing is, what is uh, making a difference of any kind and what that difference is. There's also a need to improve the quality and the usefulness of these data, both mortality data or death by suicide and on the morbidity side, which would be suicide attempts and the thoughts of suicide. So with the leadership of the Centers for Disease Control, the Action Alliance has developed recommendations for improving national data systems for suicide-related uh, surveillance. And a couple uh, needed action, uh, these are just a few examples, are promoting the use of standard definitions, um, both in how we code suicide and how we survey about what the problem is, and in uh, utilizing recommended, uh, shared recommended data elements in our surveillance efforts. Also, another uh, area for action is improving existing mortality and morbidity data systems. We do have a number of uh, systems in place, but they do need improvement or enhancement or expansion, such as the, na the National Violent Death Reporting System, though it says national, it's not only about 17 states. We can certainly learn a lot more about the scope of the problem if this was implemented nationwide. A couple of others are adding data var uh, variables about vulnerable populations such as the LGBT youth, where we know more about uh, suicide attempts and thoughts of suicide among the population, but we, we cannot tell you how many LGBT youth are dying by suicide because we don't have the systems in place to capture that data. So I'll stop there and I will turn it over. So one of our task forces um, asked the question, could we end suicide among those who are getting health care in this country? And if, you know, if we could, I mean, so how many deaths are acceptable to people who are in the health system? Um, and what are the next steps that we should take? Um, this task force pulled in the leading experts around the country in how to treat people who are dealing with um, desire to die, uh, desire to take their own life. And um, they looked, they found this example in the Henry Ford Health System in Detroit. They had a population of about 200,000 people uh, that were um, in their mental health car health system. And um, they asked themselves, you know, what, what can they do to really drive down suicide in this population? So over the course of about a decade, really doing transformational things, in four years, they had cut the suicide rate by about 75%. And then uh, shortly after that, they went 10 full quarters without a single suicide among over 200,000 people that are mentally ill folks. So um, this kind of set an example, you know, can we replicate this? Can we make this the norm in this country instead of the exception? So our task force, um, let's, let's go to the next one. Uh, our task force now is, um, is working with um, systems in about eight states, eight or nine states, and since uh, you probably are interested, we've got Kentucky, Arizona, Texas, Tennessee, Indiana, New York, Wisconsin, Utah, and Missouri um, that are involved uh, at some level in this, and we're trying to figure out what is essential in to replicate what Henry Ford did, and let's do it in behavioral health settings, and then let's also test it um, in uh, mainline health systems 
and see what we can do. Can we replicate this and make this the standard of care in this country again instead of um, just something that happened to happen once in, in Detroit? Uh, so we're driving this ahead. Uh, we're, uh, we're trying to find partners who will fund this. Um, and the SAMHSA has contributed some money to funding it. And uh, we're hoping you know, to, in the next two or three years uh, to, to make some real progress. I want to now turn it over to Colleen, who's going to talk a little bit about what we're doing in healthcare reform. One of our priorities is to integrate suicide prevention into the implementation of the Accountable uh, Affordable Care Act. Great. Thank you, David. Um, and for the sake of time, I'm just going to do a really quick overview, but please um, follow up with us afterwards. Um, you know, more. So the Action Alliance's goal is to integrate suicide prevention into healthcare reform efforts and encourage the adoption of similar measures in the private sector. To date, we've really um, been working with CMS to provide resources and technical assistance around suicide prevention. Um, while there are some behavioral health expertise within CMS, um, we really help um, provide some content expertise specific to suicide um, by providing white papers, literature reviews, um, and such. So going forward, there's really four areas that we're focusing our efforts on. Um, where there's a lot of opportunity to collaborate with CMS and really integrate suicide prevention um, into their work. The first area is early identification and intervention for those at risk. The second area is the delivery of effective treatment for suicide um, behavior. The third is improved follow-up care for folks at high risk for suicide. And the fourth area is improved data collection. Um, for early identification and intervention, we know through the National Violent Death Reporting System that folks who die by suicide are engaging with the healthcare system shortly before their death. Um, so we feel there's a lot of opportunities there to be providing screening when there's indicated risk for suicide. Um, the second area is the delivery of effective healthcare treatment. We spoke earlier to the point that um, within the field, not everyone is trained in suicide prevention, even if they are a mental health provider. Um, so how can we encourage folks to be trained and to deliver effective care? So if we're paying for treatment, we know that it's effective evidence-based treatment the patient is receiving. The third area, we know that when a patient is discharged from an emergency department or an inpatient setting, they are at very high risk for suicide during that transition. So what opportunities are there in healthcare reform related to care transitions, and follow-up care that we can um, take advantage of to improve these care transitions and close the loop for these patients at high risk. Um, there's a number of very low-cost interventions, as simple as sending out caring letters to folks after discharge, saying we're here, we have services, don't forget to you know, re-engage with us, um, and that's actually been shown to reduce suicide. Um, as well as examples of engaging the crisis center network and doing outgoing calls and follow-up calls to patients at risk. Um, again, that's a very low resource um, intervention that can be applied. And the fourth area is improving data collection. Um, Katie spoke to um, the need to improve e-coding, um, external cause of injury codes. So we have a better idea of who's showing up in emergency departments and in hospitals for intentional injuries and being able to target our interventions to those most at risk. Um, let's stop there and turn and so the, the last of the four priorities that we wanted to talk about today um, acknowledges the fact that um, we know that uh, some messaging around suicide can actually contribute to what we call contagion. It increases the rate of suicide. So if you have headlines, if you have news story after news story about suicide, you will actually increase the rate of suicide in a population that's exposed to that media. Um, so we're trying to change the conversation, as we call it, around suicide in this country, um, and so that uh, there are fewer details uh, about suicide and um, less prominent coverage um, and, and less coverage that makes people think that suicide is more common than it is, which may lower the threshold for someone who's right on the edge of perhaps taking their life. Um, we also know that positive messaging, particularly stories of people overcoming adversity, can actually lower suicide rates in a population. So if you have even uh, someone on Oprah Winfrey, let's say, um, or some 
show, I guess it's still on. <laughs> Help me. <laughs> Help me. Anyway, I, I don't watch TV. Um, if, if you have someone, some celebrity say, you know, I was thinking about killing myself, I was at this point of desperation, and then this and this and this happened, that actually gives someone else hope that perhaps tomorrow will be better, and that kind of exposure lowers suicide rates in the population. So we think that this kind of uh, messaging, changing the conversation in this country, is really important. So um, we're working out, we're reaching out to the media, we're also reaching out to the messengers. A lot of those messages come from the government, they come from the Centers for Disease Control, when they uh, announce new statistics, they come from the Department of Defense and the Veterans Affairs, from uh, SAMHSA and HHS, and they can come from Congress as well. Um, so we're trying to, to change those messages. So, next slide. And so what we want to do is have more messages about solutions and fewer messages about the problem. And there are a lot of solutions. Yeah. We have about four narratives going in this country that aren't helpful. One narrative um, really got going about two years ago. And you would think, from what you read in the papers, that if you were an LGBT youth and got bullied, that you were going to kill yourself. I mean, that was just this social narrative that got picked up. Okay, we've got another one on the military. You go out to combat, you get exposed to horrible things, you get PTSD, you come home, you start drinking, your relationships go to pot, and you kill yourself. Okay? Third narrative, middle age. Um, you're, uh, you lose your job, you maybe get another job making half what you did, you lose your house, you lose your family, you're desperate, you kill yourself. Then the fourth one um, is you're an 80 year old guy, your wife dies, you've lost everything, you know, maybe health is failing, so you kill yourself. So we have these four narratives going in this country that make people believe that suicide in those situations is much more common than it is. And guess what? The vast majority of people who are in any of those situations do not kill themselves. They don't even make attempts. They actually find ways to get through. And so we need to get those stories out. And this is something that um, I would like to propose um, to all of you who have uh, you know, the ear of a, of a Congress, uh, of a representative, that think about Veterans Day. We've got veterans employment problems, right? And we've got veterans that are having a lot of problems and they're feeling like just don't know how to get through. So we have propose, proposed, and Ani, did people get this concept sheet in their packets? Um, the, yes. Okay, so in your package, there should be a little concept paper for this for this Veterans um, Day event. And what we're proposing is that uh, each member of Congress could actually help us change the conversation around veterans issues. So it's not and in the PowerPoint, it's in the other handout that we have right on the top. Uh, great, thanks. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, you, your representative could, um, you know, contact a veteran or a few veterans um, in, in uh, his or her district. Um, maybe get the people around them who have supported them in their transition and make a story out of the success. Like the success included mental health treatment, great. The success included an employer who stuck their neck out and hired that, and that, that, um, that employer can talk about all the great things that veteran has brought into their company, great. So we can make, at least for one day, this the story. Um, now, for anyone who's interested in that, we do have the resources actually develop a little packet that would kind of guide you through that. So maybe we can work with, with Ani, and um, we can, you know, if anybody would like this idea, um, you know, I mean, right, every, every representative needs to have something to do on Veterans Day, right? So here's a chance to do something. We're going to create a little a little kit um, that will help you put this together. And there may be help from the uh, Department of Labor, got some uh, Department of Labor vet, um, Vets Office uh, representative here. Um, the uh, VA also has a wonderful little web page um, uh, to support employers and hiring vets. Anyway, that's one thing I wanted to mention that, that you can do. Another thing that, um, that mem members of Congress can do is as you're working with agencies in the federal government, any agency that deals with any of the many risk factors or protective factors for suicide, has a role to play in suicide prevention. And just like the um, uh, OJJDP, um, Juvenile Justice um, uh, groups, you know, added suicide into their grant programs just to make it 
the grantees aware that they want them to address suicide. Um, this is not something that, that requires an earmark. It doesn't require you know, more appropriations. It just requires these agencies to add suicide in these RFAs for their grant programs. So as you're, um, as you're doing oversight uh, on, on your committees uh, for these various groups <coughs> that deal with these risk factors, Bureau of Prisons and uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs, I mean, there's a whole bunch of them, um, you know, ask them, you know, or even insert report language um, that you want them to address suicide in these grant programs. It's, uh, I think it's something that we can and we really, we really need to do. Um, Up the last, um, ah, yes, I want to talk just a little bit about resources. So right now, um, thank you for the reminder. So the Action Alliance is funded kind of on a year-to-year -year basis. Mostly, oh, oh, uh, a great deal of it comes from uh, really the commitment from SAMHSA to fund this. But there's no line anywhere that you know, kind of ensures that the Action Alliance will be able to go on doing this great work um, into the next year. I mean, we just, we always, we're living year-to-year. Uh, so we just, you know, we just, we're just glad that we're living. Fortunately, um, you know, I'll, we've gotten a lot of other federal support. Um, you know, uh, ACL from HHS, um, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, um, CDC, DOD, um, Education Department, um, Health Resources Services Administration, Indian Health Service, um, the list goes on, of other feds um, that have contributed important um, work to the Action Alliance. Uh, important uh, funding, um, meeting space, for instance, you know, it costs thousands of dollars just to have a meeting uh, in a space. And so um, the Army, you know, contributed that for one meeting and the uh, National Association of Broadcasters for another. Um, Anais uh, uh, said she would help us get space here on the hill if necessary. So we're taking donations anywhere we can get it. Uh, basically, we just really believe in the work. We think that we're, we're doing important things. We're doing things that have to be done at the national level. They cannot be done at the state and local level. Um, and so, uh, you know, I would just uh, encourage you all to think about um, how you can support suicide prevention, how you can support um, the Action Alliance, um, how you can support veterans. Um, and, uh, and if you have any questions, um, you can ask them now. Or you may contact us. Is, uh, we have uh, contact information, um, yeah, you can uh, um, please feel free to contact any of us at any time. So um, we we want to get you out of here, but we also want to answer any questions that you might have. Um, so the floor is open. It's your turn. I just want to make an announcement. Uh, my name is Barbara C. I work for Congressman Cassidy, and uh, my boss and representative Danny Davis introduced or dropped last Friday. Uh, the Garrett Lake Ministry Authorization. So if any of y'all's sponsors are interested, I'll leave a little one page around the table up here for y'all. Garrett Smith Memorial Act in honor of uh, Sunday's and Sun. Doing great work across the country. Thank you. Anyone else? Question? Comment? David, yes. I have a comment. And that is, I understand setting goals about reducing and eliminating suicide. Uh, are you currently, are there plans to and I guess it's more of a recommendation if the answer is no, to track help-seeking behavior either through websites or hotlines where the, the suicide reporting, if there's more consciousness, could actually go up. It could look like the numbers are increasing when they're not. But help-seeking behavior could be a good indicator that there's traction. Right. We, um, we just launched a group of leading scientists and evaluators to think through how we evaluate some of this stuff and how we set priorities and so on. We call it the impact group. Um, it has leadership from the uh, uh, injury control research center. Injury control research center and suicide Rochester. just funded by CDC at the University of Rochester. Um, National Institute of Mental Health, Jane Pearson is, is also co-leading that and, and again access to those leading thinkers. So that's on the radar for working that. Yeah. How do you make sense of these different data? Um, and sometimes things might go up. Uh, actually, that's a good sign, right? And especially, Marie, if you can't get to, uh, you know, data like deaths by suicide for a number of years, those shorter-term outcomes are especially important. Well, it takes, takes a while to years. get to that. Path. People take seven to ten years to seek help. So if you show that that helps behavior showing up, I think that strengthens 
the, the um, all the good work you're doing. Thanks. You're doing great work. Thanks for me. Oh, I, I, I'm sorry, Brian, I'll mention the same time. I was just going to say, we do have all the statistics on the lifeline right. uh, for how many calls come in every month and you know, when we reach the millionth call for the year, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Those numbers are going up as, as well as the top of the So when you get the millionth call for the year, you like ring, when you hear that bell ring, oh, it's, it's not, not that bell. Unfortunately, it's not a great phone ring. <laughs> <laughs> so we are tracking this data. That's great, thank you. Questions, comments? I just had an addition. Um, I just wanted to remind staff that as your members, if your members are putting out press releases um, or sharing information on mental health, we do um, ask that members put the National Crisis Hotline number on those press releases. Um, you can go to our, um, see copies of our press releases for Congresswoman Napolitano. It's mandatory. We do it on all of our press releases, especially the, well, those that pertain to mental health and suicide prevention. And the reason is because as your constituents are reading this information, we want to ensure that we're also providing a direct resource for those individuals to call a number if they're in crisis or if somebody else is in crisis. So it's just something um, to remember. And if your offices do need additional resources, if you need anything else about the Action Alliance, um, please feel free to call, call our office. If your office is also working on any mental health policy related legislation, please let us know. We just like to make sure that we're using correct terminology. We, we would not want any other piece of legislation to go out from Congress that um, labels somebody as mentally defective, which is currently in federal law. So we just want to ensure that we're being um, very cautious of those things and that we're, we ourselves here on the Hill are also um, abiding by these um, these guidelines that will help to rid stigma as well. So we're in Congress with Paul Thomas' office. Questions? Yes, sir. Congresswoman uh, Wilson's office. I applaud the uh, efforts in the social media so How do you balance, however, the privacy issues that are involved there? Because you become very intimidated by social media. That things might be disclosed that they don't want to know. Uh, on social media, I mean, I, I'm not sure that there's anything that would be disclosed that they wouldn't put there. I guess I'm thinking about hacking. Ha, ha. Oh, hacking? Well, oh. Yeah, um, I really um, have not considered that. I don't know that anyone in our group is. Um, That's a very good question. But I asked earlier. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was just going to say that, that I know that uh, Facebook you know, has a lot of people working on security issues on Facebook. I assume that some of the other social media um, do the same thing. So they're always looking for uh, you know, that kind of safety and security stuff there. So you know, certainly you know, direct that kind of question to, to, to the actual you know, media um, people, whether that's Facebook. Um, I can tell you it has not come up uh, in the actual lines. Just to follow up, I, I think behind all of this, I'm hearing a need for trust, and certainly uh, trusting our brothers and sisters who will help us in whatever form. Right. Uh, I'm also hearing a lot of distrust about social media. So on the one hand, I think it's great if we can empower that. Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully there's some sense of trust that if we get into that realm, yeah. it will be uh, honored. You know, um, the connectedness piece is a lot, we're really um, focusing a lot on connectedness. And you've got great mental health treatment, uh, recovery, all that kind of stuff, wonderful for the people that will go get that care. There's also, uh, you know, human to human connections, we know are very powerful for preventing suicide. And so we're really encouraging that. I was on a, a DOD suicide prevention task force, and you know, over a period of three months, we visited uh, bases um, in military installations to talk to about a thousand military people, um, and they're all connected by by Facebook. And but we asked several of the younger um, military and enlisted folks said, you know, when when you want your supervisor, when your supervisor's kind of checking in on you, how do you want them to check in? You know, do you want uh, like a Facebook message? Do you want a text message? No. I want to hear their voice. So even you know we heard that from 18 and 19 and 20 year olds that still that human connection is a lot more powerful than you know a uh, thousand five hundred Facebook friends. Um, so uh, social media certainly um, there's potential there in finding people who are putting clues out there and how do we respond to that? Um, but in terms of building connectedness, I have an idea. A lot of times that's going to take more than you know, uh, then likes on a Facebook page. Uh, yeah. 
that's not good. But it may not be enough. Questions, comments? Great, I think, is there more ice cream? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and please feel free. I think you get the American Foundation versus the Convention for Thank you. Thank you.